My name is Libby Karen. I'd like to welcome you back. This week, what I'd like to talk about, or I actually like to hear from the experts on some theories on how they think EMDR works and also some of the research that's out there. I'll be back right after the clip. Dual attention means the brain is, is, is attending to two different things at the same time, at least two different things. And here, if a person is thinking about a traumatic experience or symptom manifestations at the same time as the sound is on, or by or eye movements are on, it's it's the paying attention to something else, you know, and maintaining that attention while the person is thinking about the, the memories and the feelings and so on, or even the flashback experience, that opens the brain for change. When you have those same, you know, uh, neural patterns in, in, in the brain experiencing, you know, uh, trauma, um, uh, the experience that the brain and, and the person has is that it's it's still happening or it's it's going to happen again real soon when which means you're out of time and place okay um, you're back in the trauma experientially but if the brain in the moment is being its attention is being drawn to the sound moving back and forth or that spot that you're looking at that just seems to hold something for you it can help the brain to be to explore in the moment uh, new ways of experiencing things and recognize that I'm not in that's the past and this is the present you know? but not because you tell the person or the brain it's because they experience it you know it comes from the inside out even if a person is consciously not that curious a person their deeper brain is always curious the um, uh, the orienting response is, is a deep survival form of curiosity it's like what's that you know over there and you know is it a threat to me so um, uh, the more stimulation you throw at, at a brain, especially the deeper brain, I'm not talking about you know, conscious distraction, but the deeper brain, the more it likes it. Okay? The, brain, it's, the brain is like a, a child, likes to play. So, so if two different bilateral modes are going asynchronously, not, not in the same pattern at the same time, the brain is a quadrillion connections has no problem tracking that and 15 other things at the same time you know respiration digestion etc um, uh, so it tends to add to that to the uh, uh, the distraction absorption that opens the brain for change opens the brain to be able to explore new pathways as opposed to just the, s the same patterns that it tends to travel over and over again so the only thing I can say about it is that uh, we did a study where we focused on, on the, mem the traumatic memory. And before the trauma is off, you see the images, the sm you smell the smells, you hear the sounds, and then you process the trauma and it becomes a story. And so it's get taken out of the sensory areas of your brain and moved into the prefrontal cortex. There's actually a single uh, brain scan study done by Frank Corrigan in Scotland of what happens during in the brain during EMDR. And what he found was that during the processing stage, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex lit up, which just so happens to be the seat of mindfulness in the brain. And mindfulness is the essential ingredient in sensory motor psychotherapy. So what if the EMDR and sensory motor are both lighting up an integrative center but coming at it from two different directions? You light up this part of the brain, the amygdala calms down. And since the amygdala is where the traumatic memories are encoded, that would suggest that reprocessing happens when you engage this part of the brain. When you're in an arousal state, the right half of the brain lights up the limbic system. Even the parts that are inhibiting the amygdala light up because they're on, on call and on, online as well. When you are in a state of calm, the left side lights up. And when the right side is lights up, the left Dorsal, dorsal lateral frontal cortex and the broker's area specifically are inhibited. You would bring those on and the right side is inhibited. So if you can bring the brain back and forth, you'll bring it in and out of potential arousal. 
And if you keep it in the left side some of the time, you're providing a state where the amygdala is inhibited. EMDR uses crossing hemispheres. That's its main thing. That's its main thing. It also involves empowerment. You use statements of empowerment to, during the testing. So you're inhibiting the amygdala through a number of different techniques. In general terms, I think if a person is looked to the right and feels more activation or looks to the left and feels less activation, the brain is in a diff it, the brain is functioning somewhat differently looking right or left. And it kind of makes sense that the brain is going to, if you look around in different positions or you tap different parts of the body, the brain is going to be, even in a subtle way, reacting differently to that stimulation. Um, uh, but uh, theoretically, I think it's about orienting. Okay? Uh, the or and the orienting response, you know, the eyes will move first and then the head and then the, and the shoulders and the rest of the torso. If there is something in our environment, not just for humans but for animals, that is a potential threat or something of interest, you know, and it's reflexive. So the fact that something may be over here or may be over here, it's almost like that's where, where the point of orientation is in our field of vision, okay? and in our field of perception. Now again, this is, this is theoretical. We have observed with many clients, um, for a client looking up like this, having to do where the, where the threat is felt or the greater activation, many clients were, were, report, will go right to a memory of being three years old and looking up at their father who was menacing them. You know? um, that's not, that's not a, a fact per se. You know, it's a fact that that's what their experience was. But it does suggest that where a person was looking at a time of a trauma, oftentimes imprints. You know, and we and for sure clients who've who've had accidents that have happened more to the right or more to the left, uh, not all the time, but we, we find a lot of the times, you know, the direction that that the accident you know uh, came from or was caused by becomes the most activated. What's interesting is you'll find with another person. You find it, it, it's not particularly activating it at all, which, which just goes to how complex we are. Uh, so uh, I think eye position has a lot to do with, with orienting. I asked you um, what, no. theoretically what do you think is happening. Do you think it's the orienting response, the interruption? So, I, I don't know. Um, with learning is that I, I have been trying to do the study with the MDR. My hypothesis is that the eye movements calm down the thalamus. And you need the thal thalamic activation in order to, to move information from the parietal cortex into the frontal lobe. Um, so we expect to almost certainly find thalamic activation. What that associative process is, is about, where all these little pieces start getting knitted together, I have, I don't know, but it's fascinating. So sad for me is that we did this EMDR study, huh? and, and our subject did extremely well. And I'm pretty sure that our EMDR study had by far the best outcome of any PTSD study ever done. And so that would make some other people say EMDR is a treatment of choice. I wouldn't say that. But it certainly proved that there is something unique and amazing about EMDR. Then we went back to NIH to get to do more studies to see what's actually going on there. And there was actually no interest in it. But the money simply is not available at this point to do the scientific enterprise of trying to solve that is the orientic response or the corpus callosum or all that all these different theories that people have about EMDR.